The State Government Finance and Veterans Affairs Committee will come to order. The first item on the agenda is House File 2447, Representative Falk. Representative Falk, this pertains to Veterans Day and veterans who have to work on Veterans Day. Am I correct? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, that is correct that the idea of this bill was brought to me by Ms. Horvick, who is the Chippewa County Veteran Service Officer, and uh, through numerous conversations and email conversations we've had, uh, started putting together an idea for this bill, and consequently that is what we have before us. And uh, the idea is that veterans should be able to go in and have Veterans Day off to be able to be with their families or to be able to have a chance to reflect on the uh, the service that they gave to their country or the work that they've done uh, in support of all of us. And uh, with that, we've put together this bill. I am much less eloquent than my uh, testifier I've brought here. She came out from western Minnesota. She made the drive down today and uh, would really like to go and offer her the chance to go and explain her thoughts, her feelings on this, the idea behind it, um, who could potentially be helped by this and uh, with that I'd, I'd like to turn it over to Ms. Horvick. Okay, uh, before we do that, Representative Falk, tell me, um, are we talking about November 11th or are we talking about the day, a, a day that is observed as Veterans Day? Um, I believe in the bill here it states on line 1.7 that uh, it's with time off for Veterans Day, November 11th. So that's the date we're talking about. Thank you very much. I will move that House File 2447 uh, is before the committee. Ms. Vorvik, yes. welcome to the committee, and please say whatever you want to say to make us help us understand the need for the bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm Stephanie Vorvik. I am from Chippewa County. I work with the Veterans Service Office there. Um, veterans come from all walks of life. They're parents, children, and grandparents. They're friends, neighbors, co-workers, and are an important part of our communities. As Americans, we should remember the selfless service of these great men and women. On Veterans Day, November 11th, Government offices are closed, and those who work in those offices get the day off. Okay. Minnesota has approximately 245,000 veterans under the retirement age. Many of these veterans are working at jobs where they can hardly get a day off. Both my husband and my dad are veterans, and they don't get the holiday off. This is a holiday that's meant to honor the selfless service of these men and women. A countless number of vets can attend their local Veterans Day programs, which are held in honor of them because they are working. Our younger generations believe that a veteran is an 85-year-old man because that's what they see when they attend a Veterans Day program at their schools. They don't get to see our younger veterans because these vets are unable to attend these programs because they are at their jobs. Now is the time to give employers and businesses the opportunity to give veterans what they deserve, a day to honor them. In the words of JFK, as we express our gratitude, we must never forget that the highest appreciation is not to utter words, but to live by them. So instead of talking about vets, let's do something for them. Representative Falk. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, Mr. Biggerstaff has done a, a very nice job in putting together a summary of this bill. But essentially, it would say that employers have the discretion to offer paid time off or unpaid time on Veterans Day. They'd, they'd have to go and provide time off to the veteran, either paid or unpaid, at their discretion. And uh, an exemption would be if there's public health or safety issues that uh, may come forth. But essentially that under the bill, employees 
must provide an employer with 30 days written notice of intent of taking time off for Veterans Day as well as a copy of the employee's DD-214 or similar documentation. And then the employer would have to go and notify, him, notify the employee whether or not that, um, paid, or that, that time off had been approved. And so we're, we're trying to make it work for everybody. I know that um, you know, we often try not to go and, and tell private businesses exactly how to run their organizations, but I think that we're being quite flexible and uh, putting in time enough process or putting in, in place enough process that it's not overly kind of cumbersome for anybody. So did Representative Falk, when you uh, were talking about the form this bill would take, were you patterning it after the time off for votes? Um, Madam Chair, I guess I'm not familiar with that uh, concept, and so I would have to say, at least in my experience, no. I know I did work with um, Ms. Warovich and also Senator Coonan uh, for putting this together, and uh, I don't know if Senator Coonan had some input into other types of legislation like this, but to my knowledge, it, not the case. So the onus would be on the veteran, though, to indicate to the employer that time off is needed. On it, that day. Uh, Madam Chair, yes, that would, it's, it's under the, the veteran is asked to go in and provide written notice at least 30 days prior to Veterans Day that they would intend to take that day off. Okay. Representative Kr Krisha. Thank you, Madam Chair. And so, I, I'm just kidding, you, the current practice now, you ask for time off and you work it out with the employer uh, as the employee why do we need a mandate to change that process? Well, Madam Chair and Representative Falk, Representative, Falk. Representative Krisha, not all employers are sometimes willing or want to offer Veterans Day off to, to veterans. And I think that uh, if you've served our country and we have a day to honor you, no matter who you work for, I guess with the exception of the, the public health and safety aspects of it, you should have that option if, if you're able to go and provide that written notice at least 30 days prior and, and work with the employer. I, I mean, the, we do try to give the employers flexibility, and if they cannot satisfy all the requirements, they, we try to make sure that their denials are for the minimum amount of people affected. I don't know if uh, Ms. Vorovich has some commentary she'd like to add to that. Ms. Vorovich. This would be... Um without penalty, without having to take an extra vacation day, um, such as my, if my dad were to take a day off from his job, he would have to take a vacation day. Um, his job is not very willing to give the employees time off. Um, so this hopefully would give uh, veterans the opportunity to take the day off without any type of penalty to take an extra vacation day from their employer. <coughs> Representative O'Driscoll. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Fall, thank you for thinking of our veterans. Um, there, there is a collective appreciation on this committee as well as the legislature for the work that the veterans done. And I appreciate your testifier being here today as well and uh, in sharing this. I've oftentimes thought of myself about um, having been at a number of veterans um, day events and, and your testifier's comment of people thinking it's an 85-year-old man is, is very apropos um, in what you see at these kinds of things. So anytime we can encourage folks to do that, I'm, I'm willing to do it. I think there are other methods that we can do it with as well, but one that I'm looking at your bill and I'm not 100% sure how your bill would address this. How, what happens if we have a small employer where there's two or three people that are in that um, in the business and we have an owner who's a veteran and two employees that's a veteran and everybody wants the day off. How do we meet customers' needs and how do we pick who's going to have priority um, for having that day off or is the employer just going to by default have to close the business if everybody's met the statutory requirement of notice? Well, Madam Chair, and thank you, Representative O'Driscoll. I guess if, if you read the bill, starting at um, line 1.18, you know, the employer shall at least 10 days prior to Veterans Day notify the employee if the employee shall be provided paid or unpaid time off on Veterans Day 
if the employer determines that the employer is unable to provide time off for Veterans Day for all employees who request time off, the employer shall deny time off to the minimum number of employees needed by the employer to protect public health and safety or to maintain minimum operational capacity as applicable. And so there is flexibility there. Uh, one thing, too, that Mr. Biggerstaff noted um, is that this is very similar, almost the same as a uh, law that's uh, enacted in, in Iowa. Is that correct, Mr. Biggerstaff? Mr. Biggerstaff? Madam Chair, yes. How about the one in Oregon? Madam Chair, I'm not as familiar with that one, but I believe they're, for all intents and purposes, pretty closely related. Or... I ask that because obviously <coughs> other states are doing it. <laughs> Representative Ojis. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Falk, that's why I wanted to bring this to the, the attention of the committee is that there is also a provision that is in here that deals with that because we don't want to um, compromise our smaller employers on this. And I, I my, my assumption is that most employers um, and employees, if this is important to them, will work that out and have a mutual respect and appreciation for one another on that. Um, I guess I'm curious to hear what other members of the committee have to say as well relative to that. Thank you. Representative O'Driscoll, and this bill does have to go to um, labor, workplace, and regulated industries for that discussion, for the discussion on some of the questions of the relationship to the employer. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. I get a second chance to hear the bill. All right. <laughs> uh, Representative Krisha. And thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, Representative O'Driscoll, I think you raised some great concerns. Um, and just questions as I think through this, uh, the intent makes a lot of sense. And I understand it absolutely we're trying to do out of respect for our, our veterans. And I think you'll find little resistance to that. Uh, when we get into the other side of it, we handle lots of bills here or see many of trying to do veterans priority hiring, trying to do many things for veterans to get them the jobs. And it seems to me fair to weigh that out with when you need them to work, to work it out with the employer. Um, the question that I have here and a, a follow up before was at the start of your employment time uh, with somebody, you get notification or you should be, of, of what your time off is, how many vacation days and all that. And all of that, and sick leave, all of that is designed to help you plan as an employee your days off throughout the year. Um, one of which, if Veterans Day is important to you, should be on your list of things to ask for. Um, so I, I'm hesitant to take a bill like this, this open-ended, and get between the employer and the employee and create some mandates that could create some hard tensions between somebody who, who's trying to push something when, you know, that conversation, that icky conversation of it's in state law, I, I deserve this, rather than, hey, let's have a conversation about my time off and, and working within the confines of the handbook. So um, are, those, are those types of concerns and, and the strains that may put on that employee-employee relationship a concern at all? Ms. Vorvik? Um, well, Madam Chair and Representative Krisha, I do think our veterans deserve this. I mean, it's, it's not a question of whether or not it's in state law. It's a question of, you know, whether or not we feel that they deserve this, and I feel that they do. And uh, we have language here. I could read it again, but I read it once before that does, I think, give some flexibility to the employer and the employees to try to work out those issues. But the other thing to realize here is that every employer in the state of Minnesota is essentially playing by the same rules. And so if you're a veteran working for a small company, large company, what have you, under this, we want to make sure that those veterans have the option to go and be able to observe a day that we dedicate to them in the way that they choose. And Representative Krisha, I appreciate your question, because uh, your um, reflection on who else does it affect kind of thing and that conversation as, or dialogue between employer and employee is always a desired thing. And that's why the next committee in labor and uh, workplace and regulated industries will, I would assume they have a little more expertise on those kind of issues than we do, but somewhere along the line, Representative Falk and Ms. Vorvik, I think you're also going to be 
questioned about, well, what about the mother of a veteran or the father of a veteran who waited for them to be home for so long and have special things to do on Veterans Day because that day is so important to them? Or the spouse of the veteran who's managed for eight months with four kids and um, <laughs> waited for the soldier to come home or the, person, the veteran to come home. Um, and that day is a day of respect or memory in some cases. Are we going to then include others, or are we going to say, no, it's just veterans? Uh, Madam Chair, that's not my intention to ex expand this. I know that there's you know, other sacrifices that family members make, and those shouldn't be discounted. But with the intent of this bill, my legislative intent for this is to make sure that it applies strictly to those who have served our country. Representative Falk, then. I think we need more cases of how the present federal and state law about Veterans Day <coughs> does not cover the issue. Well, Madam Chair, I think that's Part of the reason why Ms. Horvick is here and, and why this bill is before us is, once again, some of the experiences that perhaps she has saw in, in her work. And if she wants to further expand upon that, I'd happily let her do that. There were quite a few people, Ms. Horvick, that uh, were not here promptly. And so if you could go over that, that part of your testimony we were talking about. Um, the need for the bill where veterans are forced to work on Veterans Day. Yes, Madam Chair. Um, there are approximately 245,000 veterans under the retirement age, and many of these veterans are working um, during Veterans Day and they can hardly get a day off as it is and uh, this holiday is meant to honor the selfless service of these men and women and a countless number of vets can't attend their local Veterans Day programs which is actually held in honor of these veterans and um, they, these veterans, they deserve they deserve the, this day. They are the ones that have earned it. And I know that you had mentioned about the spouses or the mothers and fathers or um, family members, but I think that if you were a family member, you would understand why the actual veteran would get this day off and you wouldn't ask for yourself to get an extra day off. You would understand why the veteran alone would get a day for themselves because you know that they themselves have earned that day off because of what they had went through. Thank you. Representative Leidegger. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for uh, asking her to repeat Part of that testimony, I think that's important, and I want to. I just I want to weigh in on this a little bit, and I know that it's going to go to the next committee and have another hearing about the labor issues of that. But we are the veterans committee, and there's a lot of veterans from both sides, and I, you know, I don't. It, this is a difficult one to comment on, um, and I'm just going to. I think I'll start by saying. I, I have an aversion to this. I don't like, uh, I totally understand what you're doing, and I appreciate it very much. Um, but I don't think that this is what veterans are asking for, looking for, or want. So I'll start with a couple of questions, if it's okay. Um, did, uh, Stephanie, did you, did you get a chance to 
work this issue around to like your local VFWs and American Legions and talk to some of the veterans. I mean, how did this come about, yes, this bill? Madam Chair, I work with veterans every day. It's my job. Uh -huh. And um, it is a, it's an issue that does come up fairly often. And we do have a number of vets that, that do work normal, regular, everyday jobs. And they have to work on Veterans Day. There are, there are programs on Veterans Day that are run through the public schools that the VFW or Legion do put on and these veterans they don't they don't get to attend these programs. The people that attend the the Veterans Day programs are the more elderly veterans, the the ones who are in the nursing homes or the ones who are already retired and they don't have jobs. So the ones who want to go to these programs, they don't go to them because they are already working because they feel that they can't go to them because they'd have to take a vacation day or they'd have to take a day without pay, say, and they just feel like they are not allowed to take a day off of work. <clears throat> Representative Leidegger. Thank you. Um, the it's it's already been said. I'll, I'll go. Um, you know, I think that veterans, if they they know when it's coming, they know when Veterans Day is is there. If it's that important to them, uh, you know, it happens every single year. And I think most veterans, if, if if they truly want to be there, they can make those kinds of arrangements. I would say, in you know, ninety some percentage. The percent of the time of the time they're able to do that, and that's already been addressed by some of the questioning. Um, I, I don't. I just have this uh, feeling that most veterans, uh, they they want as many people as possible to go to these events. And my feeling, for instance, is, is uh, I would gladly stay and work and take, uh, take 10 people's work and, and do those jobs and do that, their jobs to have them go, other people go to these events. Because it is a day in which, you know, you try to get as, as many of our population out there to learn. It's a great time to shake the hand of the veterans who are there to listen to some of the speeches. Um, it's, a, it's an opportunity for people that may not have anything to do with the military to go and finally get a taste of it, get a taste of what's going on, get a taste of what, what veterans were like. And you hear that in the speeches. And as a veteran, uh, I mean, I would, I, I think, and it's just a guess, but I think we would, we'd rather go back and, and for the day, go run those jobs and let everybody else come on out and see what's going on. You know, in today's world, there's a far less percentage of our population that has any idea what goes on in the military. There are families that don't have anybody that participate in the military. It's changed drastically over the last 60 years when uh, well, just uh, 30 years ago, that in our population there would be there's about 30 percent of the people that had some so sort of military experience. Today, as our population has grown to over 300 million, I mean, you're talking about less than five percent of the people that in our population that know anything about it. Um, so, and I'm sure there's many other things I could say and many other questions I could ask, but. Uh, I, for one, don't like the idea of having a government say, okay, because you're a veteran, you get a chance, you know, you get a day off. It just, it doesn't seem right. It doesn't feel right. I totally understand and appreciate what you're doing, but I, I'm going to vote against the bill. Representative Newton. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And, uh, I I'd like to just say one thing is generally speaking, uh, and I, I am in support of the bill, uh, Veterans Day is usually observed on a Saturday. 
you know, we have some yeah. kind of a celebration on Saturday. Uh, so the number of people that you're talking about that would be working, I think, is, is minimal. Uh, but I do have a question, Representative Falk. Is it uh, your intent in this uh, bill to include active duty military personnel and especially uh, House uh, research staff personnel? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Newton. I'm not opposed to that. I guess I'd have to ask Mr. Biggerstaff just what the, um, you know, this is somewhat similar to what Iowa has done, but maybe what the other states that have enacted similar legislation have done. Um, I have to admit that I'm, I'm not as well versed in some of the distinctions between the uh, different benefits offered to people who are currently serving active duty versus those who are veterans. Um, in the bill, it, it does, um, or excuse me, in the research <coughs> brief here, it, it does state that um, you'd have to show a copy of your employee, your employee's DD. 214 or similar documentation to show that you are a veteran. And uh, maybe Mr. Biggerstaff could, could help clarify. Mr. Biggerstaff. Uh, Madam Chair and members, in, in terms of, of offering this to active duty personnel, one big issue would be for federally active personnel, it would be the state mandating the federal government to do something which is generally problematic. So I don't think that it would apply in those situations. In terms of the active duty folks who are active under the Minnesota National Guard, for instance, I, the way that it's written, um, I think it would probably apply, but I'm not positive. I'd have to, I'd have to look into it a little bit more. And but or Mr. Biggerstaff, what if they were having a flyover and then the pilot said, no, I don't want to fly over because I'm just going to go to the watch the flyover. Hmm, then who would fly? It's a good question, Madam Chair. Whew, what a dilemma we're getting into. And I would say, Madam Chair, and to Representative Newton, if there's some language that can be added to, to clean that up or to further clarify, I'm absolutely amenable to that. And I think... Um, when we, we've asked for a fiscal impact. And uh, if there is a fiscal impact, in just that situation would be a fiscal impact, uh, the bill is going to have to come back to this committee. <coughs> so, Representative O'Driscoll. Thank you, Madam Chair. You did just hit one of the things I was questioning. This does look like this has some financial impact. Um, many of the people who work at our state veterans' homes are veterans themselves, and we could potentially, the way this bill is written, have the November 11th, which it says in line 1.7, with time off for Veterans Day, comma, November 11th, and we could have that holiday being celebrated as a state or national holiday on a date other than the 11th because it falls on a weekend. So we could have in some years, many years as a matter of fact, because there's seven days in a week, where we could end up having people requesting time off for the official holiday and people requesting time off and or November 11th, the way that this bill is written. So um, there could be the potential for overtime um, within our state agencies. So I see there's a real potential for state fiscal impact on this as well as potentially for private employers as well. So, um, And I don't know if that would meet the uh, prescription on uh, one point one, two, that says employers to be exempt if it's significant economic or operational disturbances. Um, you, could, you could avoid the operational disturbance by paying triple time to someone to come in who's not a veteran to give a veteran time off, then it would ask the question, is that a significant economic impact on a state budget and or private budget? So um, very, th these two terms are not defined either in this bill this section or in this, this statute as to what those mean. So it's uh, open to interpretation, I guess. So I'm interested to see what the, the uh, fiscal note would say. Oh, and Madam Chair, Mr. I guess. Paul, Representative Paul. Thank you, Madam Chair. And to that point, though, I mean, there's, there's no requirement that it be paid time off. You know, it is at the discretion of the employer, whether it's paid or unpaid. And with the 30-day uh, prior written notice, you would hope that the employer would be able to go and schedule a person to go and work those hours or that shift 
without having to go in and pay an instance either overtime, double overtime, triple overtime, whatever you may have, because they're able to work and, and plan accordingly. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just for the committee's benefit, um, because I do sit on the labor workforce and regulated industries, when we do look at state contracts, uh, many of those govern uh, a bidding and a seniority on those, and so people are assigned to shifts. And so to try to say that we have a 30-day in advance um, the ability to do that, those shifts and those um, things are bid out by employees through their collective bargaining agreements to be able to have certain shifts certain times. What it might do is cut down on the amount of overtime that would be required because of short-term requirements for individuals to change questions to cover shifts versus longer range planning. So we, we, there is going to be some fiscal impact. So again, I want to see that fiscal note um, before we, we would move forward with something like this. Um, Representative Wills. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you for bringing the bill forward and for us to review it. And I do appreciate the intention of the bill. And we want to make sure we're taking care of our veterans. And just hearing the discussion today, I had some questions of my own uh, about the language. Um, and I have a concern about the 30-day um, prior written notice language on um, in Subdivision 3. Uh, my concern is that we could potentially have a situation where it would backfire on the employee, on the veteran, um, if, say, the veteran were to go to their employer a week before Veterans Day um, and request that time off. If, if this were um, in law, the employer could look at this and say, oh, well, I have statutory um, protection, I guess you could say, um, to deny you that day off because it's after that 30-day deadline. Um, so I, I just see that as problematic. And I mean, right now, an employee could go um, and, and ask for that time off with short notice and, and work that out with their employer. So I think this makes it um, more difficult to be able to give time off. And then I'm also thinking about um, employees who are in roles such as snowplow drivers or emergency personnel, doctors, or, or police um, uh, law enforcement, and it, I guess it would concern me if they're all taking the day off. Um, and I don't know what the percentage of veterans we have in those roles, or if, if you have looked at um, how to address these concerns. If you could, if you could answer those questions, uh, Representative Paul. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I guess Representative Wills, I, I look at your argument, and you say that well, you know, it creates statutory requirement that you have at least 30 days. You can still work out with your employer whatever you want, but right now there's no requirement. And so the basis and grounds for denial of having veterans stay off for a veteran are greater under current statute than they would under this bill. And so I don't necessarily think that that's as strong of an argument because, you know, right now the veteran's ability to go and request this is pretty limited or else they're going to have to go and use up other vacation time or other types of accrued benefit. And really, I think, if we're going to go and be respectful of the service and we have a holiday specifically for veterans, that perhaps they shouldn't have to go and use up those other benefits. And um, I know we do have a number of veterans that serve in public safety functions, and they do an admirable job <laughs> there. And it, I don't necessarily believe that every single one of them would take advantage of this, but if that were to be the case, once again, by trying to work with their schedulers, by providing that 30-day written notice, and also by the protections we have in here that deal with public safety and health, and trying to at least maintain operation, minimum operational capacity, I think all of those questions and concerns are addressed. Is this perfect? I'm not willing to say that, but rarely are any bills or statutes Perfect, and I think Representative Murphy or Chair Murphy can probably attest to that in, in her years of, of service here. There's always need for improvement. Representative thank you. Wills. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for the explanation. I, I understand what you're saying. I just I don't necessarily agree because the language itself says that the employee shall provide the employer with at least 30 days prior written notice of the employee's intent to take time off for Veterans Day. And to me, in my mind, um, that 
creates a deadline. So I still have concerns. Representative Benson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'll reserve, I'm in the next committee too, so I'm going to reserve most, if not all, my questions, but one to that. I, I heard a couple of times, and I just heard it from Representative Falk, but I didn't hear it from the other testifier, that in some way that this bill would uh, provide a, somewhat of a guarantee for them not to have to take their vacation time. And it, and it really does not do that. Um, you know, in, in reading it, because uh, in, in subdivision two, an employer in complying with the section shall have the discretion of providing paid or unpaid leave. Um, so, I mean, if the employee comes, they, they meet the deadline and they say, I'd like to ha take that off, and, and they have the opportunity because no one else wants the day off or whatever, uh, the uh, employer is no, under no obligation to say that it's paid leave. And, and could easily say, if you want it paid, you're going to have to take your PTO or your vacation day. So there, there's really nothing in here uh, from, for guaranteeing uh, the veteran on that particular day that they're going to get, not have to use their vacation time. Uh, so if you're under that, I, and it seems like that's the way it's been answered a couple times in these questions, uh, that, that's, that you are. But there's really nothing in here that would guarantee that. Now, Madam Chair, I'll, I'll stop with that, and you can answer that if you'd like, but uh, uh, I'll ask my other questions when we get to labor workforce. There's a lot, I mean, I, we, we need to have good legislation. And uh, no is perfect, but this has lots of holes uh, right now. And so uh, even the intent of what you're trying to do uh, has a, a myriad of problems. But um, if you could comment on that. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Representative Benson. I mean, if the employer chose to go and offer this day unpaid, but the veteran still has the right to take the day off, theoretically they could request vacation pay for that time. But there's no requirement that they have to receive vacation pay. And I don't think I ever stated that they would have to go and request vacation pay. And our representative Leidegger indicated that a person could go and use, or a veteran could use vacation pay to take the day off and still receive pay, but this is providing a lot of flexibility to the employers. Let's get back to what the real goal is here. The real goal is to ensure that if a veteran wishes to go and observe a day of rest on Veterans Day, they should have that right because they have earned it in the sacrifice that they have made for our country. That's what the goal of this legislation is. Representative Howe. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I actually uh, want to support the bill. I just can't get there quite yet. Uh, I actually think there's there's some folks out there that really would like to take some time off to attend an event. I guess my question is: is is there any consideration for possibly? Do they have to take the whole day off, or can they take a part day off to attend an event and come back to work? Representative Powell. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Powell, the bill is not prescriptive. That would have to be worked out with the uh, employer. But as is written here, it's designed to give the option for a day off of work. Now, if a employee were to request a partial day, I would <coughs> hope that they could work that out with their employer. And being that the employer probably values their skills and expertise, then the job that they do would be amenable to only accepting a half or partial day if the uh, the two could come to an agreement. Representative Howe. Thank you. And, and I am surprised we're still holding the committee at this time because I know Hermantown's playing their hearts out in the state hockey tournament. But, uh, Five to seven. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you're on top of it. But I, Only with the help of... But the other question I have is, the, the it says the employer shall have at least at, at least 10 days prior to Veterans Day notify the employee if the employee shall be provided paid or unpaid leave time off. Where's the what if statement that says if they didn't do that, then what? If not this, then what? What, if, what happens if they don't notify them within 10 days? Uh, Madam Chair, Representative Powell, I guess I'm not as familiar with all of the rules and regulations that govern employee labor relation law, but um, having not served on that uh, respective committee, but for that, I guess when it comes to enforcement or actions, of course, I'd have to ask Mr. Biggerstaff or some other counsel to go in and help enlighten me and, and the committee as to uh, what type of recourse or 
cause of action might be applicable. Thank you. I don't know if Mr. Biggerstaff had anything to offer or not. Mr. Biggerstaff? <clears throat> Madam Chair and members, I think that uh, one of the considerations is, is that the bill doesn't necessarily mandate a day off. Effectively, what it mandates is a consideration of a day off, whether it be paid or unpaid. So I think the answer to Representative Hall's question is, if the employer within, or, uh, prior to, or at least 10 days prior to Veterans Day notified the employee that they would not get a day off, I believe that the statutory requirement would be met because it's a requirement that the employer consider a day off, not that they give a day off, not that they decide whether it's paid or unpaid, just whether they consider if the employee may have the day off. So I think, I, I don't know that there's necessarily a need for a what if in that scenario, but um, <clears throat> if, you know, I, I just think that the, the statute's been met in that case. Matt. Madam Chair, if I can just follow up. Thank you, Madam Chair. It, well, when you when I see coming from a, my background, when I see shall, that's a must. And if he must do that, you normally there's a cause. There is here's the requirement, and if you don't meet the requirement, here's what's going to happen. So is it that it's automatically if he doesn't respond in ten days and notify it, you get the day off, or? It doesn't say that, and I guess I'm concerned that when I say shall, your shall do this, you must do this, there's usually a, if I don't do this, this is what happened. The other piece that confused me is when we had this discussion about Veterans Day being not on November 11th, is my, if my history doesn't serve me right, it's always on November 11th, and you might celebrate it with a parade on another day, but I believe that it's always been the 11th day, the 11th hour of the 11th month. That's what my daddy told me when he. Came. Thank you. I, I just wanted to make sure I wasn't missing something. It was all. And, and Madam Chair, <laughs> Madam Chair, to that point too, I think you know some. It may have been incorrectly stated that you know this would be observed on multiple days, Veterans Day and or November 11th, but that's not the case. It's Veterans Day, comma as the language reads, Veterans Day, comma November 11th, comma. So it's reflective of itself. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I and I was. That's where I was going to go. Um, do we know what the federal law is surrounding this when it comes to uh, labor or what they do? I mean, is there any? Do you, do you know? Does anybody know? I bet the people in the labor committee do. Mr. Biggerstaff? Uh, Madam Chair and uh, Rep Representative, there have been bills introduced at the federal level the last number of years. I don't know specifically what's happened with them. I don't believe any of them have passed that would require something like this for the federal government. Um, and I'm not aware of any, I'm not aware of any federal requirement that requires an employer to consider this. That's my understanding. I remember, you know, my memory is a little shaky, but I remember a lot of these uh, initiatives over the years at the federal level. And one of the arguments, I don't want to get way off of this thing, but uh, I remember the argument was, you know what, we would much rather try to find uh, a law in which you're allowed to bring the dependents, usually it's the dependents, then you were starting to go down uh, talk about that. It's normally the children and the wives of, of those that, uh, that have died in, in the line of service. We are always trying to find ways to bring children to those events. And, um, and there's organizations out there. In fact, we touched on that in Operation Homefront uh, early on when we, uh, of the 9-11 of the, uh, the people that went over and when, uh, when several of those uh, men had fallen, we made sure that uh, we would go to employers, uh, get get those uh, children and the wives off, and bring them to the events as honored guests. And the um, nonprofit community uh, does that a lot. I mean, you've got uh, Red Cross initiatives and USO, Navy Marine Corps Relief, Operation Homefront. All these uh, organizations they they have a list of the gold mothers and the uh, uh, organization and the dependents. And um, 
try to ensure that those people, you know, go to these uh, uh, go to these ceremonies. And I think that's where, uh, that, and that's what I was driving to in the first time I was talking about that the that the veterans themselves are not. Uh, you now, yes, we want to go, and I, I've always tried to go to these events, but I'm not looking for special treatment to get off. We'll make our plans to get off, but let's make sure that we get the dependents and let's remember the those that have fallen. A lot of the speeches are all about that. So it's a lot about it and it's a lot about remembering that and remembering uh and in and, and, and acknowledging the dependents. So I just once again I think that this is this may not be the right way to go. And that's, uh, I just don't think it's, it, this is the right bill. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you. Rick? I'll just maybe con conclude uh, the discussion on this bill. You know, I, I support, uh, if we can uh, get the wording right, uh, this probably will be done in the next committee. Uh, but if you take a look at the history of, of Veterans Day, it was originally Armistice Day, and then in 1954, Dwight D. Eisenhower uh, uh, proclaimed it as being uh, Veterans Day. And then there was a bill in 1968 at the federal level that uh, it was going to be observed with uh, other George Washington's birthday, other, other days, and so forth. It would be a three-day weekend. And, uh, but the problem with that was a lot of the states, a lot of states didn't agree with that. So then the president turned it back to November 11th as being the day for, for Veterans Day. And uh, I think uh, as a state, I think we do a very good job observing Veterans Day. And uh, if we can uh, put together some, some language, language uh, that uh, uh, can be uh, observed or that can be uh, agreed to in the next committee, I think uh, maybe you need to do some tweaking. Uh, maybe the shell is a little bit too strong or maybe May would be the best way. But I think most, most uh, employers would go out of their, bend their way backwards to try to uh, help veterans uh, observe that day. I know I've spoken at many Veterans Day events and uh, uh, many of these veterans will try to get there and the employers will be trying to help them get there. So we uh, take it to the next committee. Thank you, Representative Detmer. Representative Rodriguez. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a procedural question. Since there is a fiscal um, impact to this, what's going to happen once we've learned that? Is it coming back here? Do we have jurisdiction? So it may go from here to labor, then back here, so we will have a chance to see the, the final, or is it something we should be laying over until we get that information and decide what we do with it before we send it to labor? Because of the short deadlines, it's under the condition that when the fiscal note comes, if there's a fiscal impact, it will be returned to this committee. I renew my motion that um, this bill, two four, House File 2447, be re-referred to the Committee on Labor, Workplace, Workplace and Regulated Industries. And Representative Falk is going to remember that he has to check on the fiscal impact and return it back here if there is one. <clears throat> and I'm sure Ms. Roberts is going to tell me about it, and I will remind Representative Falk too. Because, uh, but this discussion is, uh, was enlightening, and I think Mr. Biggerstaff got some ideas on how language uh, could be fine-tuned. Uh, hearing or seeing no other hands, uh, I renew my motion. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Aye. The motion is adopted and the bill will be sent on to Labor Committee. And you'll have another, another chance. And what's the score now, Mr. Marvel? Still has the score. 5-3 for period. Oh, no, they got one more. <laughs> Don't know how much time's left. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. I appreciate your time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Ms. Borvik. We you. appreciate your testimony. This one's going to be much faster. Represent Detmer, yes. House File 2233. Much faster. 
we're only 40 minutes behind. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I'd like to get uh, House File 2233 in the proper order. I do have the A1 amendment All right. to get the uh, language uh, the way we want it. Basically on page 4, line 20, after service, insert, uh, or who separated from the military after fewer than 20 years of service with service-connected disability. and. Uh, Originally, when I had it drawn up, uh, I forgot about that group of uh, men and women. I wanted to make sure that they were part of the legislation. So uh, I move uh, the A1 amendment. Representative Detmer moves that House file. Two two three three, as amended, or, or, <laughs> moves um, the that the House File two two three three go to the Tax Committee. Yeah. But yes, first, Marge. we need to amend it first. We yeah. need amendment adoption of amendment two two three three a one. Yes. And are we amended? Do you, to, do you want to speak to the amendment? It's the uh, House was be uh, a one amendment, and uh, I just introduced that. And uh, if that's uh, approved by the committee, then I would like to then uh, recommend that House File two two three be referred to uh, the Tax Committee. All in favor? House File two two three. <laughs> 3A1, say aye. Aye. Opposed? Amendment is adopted. Representative Detmer. Yes, thank you, uh, Madam Chair and, and committee. Um, um, you know, looking at the last bill that we did and, and uh, prior to this one, I know I think every veteran, uh, men and, um, male or female, would be uh, encouraged with the, this bill, House File 2233. Um, currently, we have 377,000 uh, veterans that live in Minnesota. Uh, these are the figures I got from the Minnesota Department of Veterans Affairs. Now, out of that 377,000, there's only 4.7 percent of those are veterans that have are retired. Uh, that means 20 years or more of service. Only 4.7 percent of those are retired. That means that we've got about 18,000 veterans in Minnesota that are living in Minnesota and retired and drawing a uh, retirement pay from the, the military. Um, I believe that House File uh, 2233 will give it an incentive to encourage veterans to uh, stay here in Minnesota uh, during their retirement years or actually come to Minnesota and retire here and stay here. Uh, there's benefits that uh, retired uh, military men and women uh, receive, have earned, um, that will bring back to the state of Minnesota and stay here in Minnesota. Number one is their skill sets they've learned after 20 years. Uh, all the skill sets that they've learned, and many of them will probably be in their 40s, so they'll come back to Minnesota um, and stay here, and they will maybe build companies, hire people, uh, they'll buy homes, uh, be part leadership in the communities, and uh, their educational benefits follow them and now their spouse and their children can use these educational benefits for college. Uh, also the, the, through the Montgomery GI Bill and their health benefits with TRICARE will follow them back to the state for the, them and their families. And they'll, they'll, as I mentioned before, they'll purchase homes, cars, vehicles, whatever, be part of our communities. Uh, so it's really investing into our, into our economy, uh, having these people come back to, and stay here in Minnesota. Um, basically, what the, what the bill says is that for every year of active duty, uh, excuse me, for every year of service, whether you're active duty or guard and reserve, uh, you can subtract fifteen hundred dollars when you do your taxes at the at the end of the year. So there is going to be a fiscal note. We'll know that when we get to the tax committee, and uh, 
with that, I, uh, most of you know uh, Ralph Donace, um, who's a retired veteran, and he would like to speak uh, uh, to the bill, too. Mr. Dene, do you want to share with us? Yes, ma'am. My Welcome. name is Ralph Dene. I live in Elk River, Minnesota. I am a TRIA member. That's the Retired Enlisted Association. I'm also the chairman of the United Veterans Legislative Council of Minnesota. Our council has voted to support this bill. Uh, to give you a little bit of insight, you talk about a fiscal bill. How about a third of a billion dollars that is now in the hands of Wisconsin because in 2001 they went tax-free on, re on retirements. The handout that I put in your, your packets shows that amount of money. Currently in 2012, uh, Close to $48 million more went into Wisconsin's coffers because the people living there, they're spending the money there than did Minnesota. And over the last 10 years, if you look at the percentage, Minnesota on the far right-hand side on the top of the page, we haven't grown. We have some great industries in Minnesota. If you go back in history, there's a lot of uh, businesses up in the Iron Range, Greyhound, uh, just numerous businesses that were started by veterans. I have a college degree, as do most 20 year plus veterans. In order to get promoted, you had to go to college. If you didn't have college credits come time for promotion, they said, eh, we're gonna promote him or her because they have college. So when I came back, I actually had money that I could have had my son use to go to college when I retired, but he already had a degree. He works for DNR in the state. And unfortunately, Daddy paid for that because <laughs> I wasn't out yet and I hadn't changed the Montgomery bill. But I just want you to understand that when you get ready to retire, you go to these what they call TAP programs. I keep changing the name of it. But basically, it's a program to make you understand where your options are to move in the United States. And unfortunately, one of the things they point out is Minnesota is one of the ten worst for a military retiree to come to. It's published in magazines all over, so it's nothing. It's not anything that we're just making up here to make it sound good. It's been, for several years, when I look at those, I go, wow, you know, they're really tagging us. I want to see those men and women come back to Minnesota. I think we're missing out on a great asset. In past years, uh, I've probably done this now about 12 years. We've had CEOs of corporations come and say, I want to hire the veterans. I can't get them to move to Minnesota. Uh, my daughter, unfortunately, won't be living back in Minnesota because her husband refuses to pay our taxes. So my grandchildren and my great-grandchildren aren't going to be in Minnesota. That's a loss that I have to kind of eat. And many times over the years, some of the people sitting in your chairs have to say, yeah, my daughter's not coming back or my son's not coming back purely because of taxing these pensions. But I think more than anything, we need to realize if Minnesota wants to go forward, we need these young men and women to come back to Minnesota to help lead our state down the road. Thank you, ma'am. I'll be glad to take any questions of anybody. Representative Khan. Um, trying to check, is this part of federal conformity or would this be going in the opposite direction of federal conformity? Mr. Baker, staff. Uh, Madam Chair and Representative Khan, this is not part of the federal conformity package. This is uh, only, this only applies, this is only a state by state uh, okay, tax so law issue. We'd be going in the opposite of the federal conformity that we've asked to do so much. Yeah. So. Mr. Baker, staff. Madam well, Chair, Representative Khan, there are two. I think there are two distinct okay. issues. Federal conformity is its sort of own thing, and then this would be something that the federal government doesn't offer the subtraction, but it's not tied to any of the conformity items that that the legislature has considered. Okay, and then I have a question for Mr. Donays. Is that why haven't you moved to Wisconsin? Because this is where Mama wants to live. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's the whole bottom line for me. I would live somewhere else had it not be that this is where Mama wants to live. I remember that from last year. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Mama wants Mama gets. Well, you know, I would, 
Rep. No. I guess I consistently vote against this bill, and I intend to vote against it again because I consider this to be a totally n uh, going in an, in the opposite direction of our progressive tax system. I think we have a much more progressive tax system than Wisconsin does, and that requires looking at total income as part of the part of what we tax. So, you know, in, unless we unless it's shown that um, that we need to do this to make our tax system more progressive, I intend to vote against it. Thank you, Representative Purcell. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the uh, question I have at uh, Representative Detmer, um, uh, are there any states that you're aware of that offer this uh, deduction, um, whether it's 1,500 or, or whatever, um, another number, for all honorably discharged veterans, regardless of how many years they've served, give them a deduction for each year that they serve. Madam Chair and, and Representative, I think our researcher looked into that. This is a little bit different. I know uh, Rep Representative Newton has a bill similar to this, where uh, his just deals with those with active duty service. And. Uh, um, Mr. Vigasta, did, did we check on other states? Uh, this is different than what other states do. Other states, they, they do other types of, 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 not necessarily deductions, but they don't count the, the retirement pay. This is just not retirement pay. And I think uh, Representative Kahn thinks this is the same bill that we introduced before. It's not. This is just a deduction when you do your taxes. So if your joint income, you and your spouse, is a joint income of $60,000, let's say, you can deduct $1,500 per year of, of, of service from, from when you do your taxes. That's the way I understand what we're doing here. Is that correct, Mr. Fingerstaff? Madam Chair, yes, and I'm not, I don't have any information on hand in terms of how other states have treated this. I think that it's important to note that this does require 20 years of service. Uh, with the, with what the amendment did was add sort of one caveat to that, and that those are individuals who, for instance, were um, discharged through a medical board for service-connected disability prior to 20 years. In some small set of instances, those individuals receive a portion of their retirement pay as well as disability pay. The disability pay is already not included based on federal law. So this would, this would also provide the benefit to the generally small amount of retirement pay that those individuals get on top of it. Represent Purcell. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, just as, as a follow-up, <clears throat> it just occurs to me that if we're part of our goal here is to welcome veterans into Minnesota, mm -hmm. that we would offer some kind of a tax deduction for them for every year they've served. I know a lot of veterans that got two, four, six, eight, ten go right up the line, uh, but but never were career and never retired. That would appreciate this, Madam Chair. Uh, yes, and. Uh, <laughs> I agree with you, but I think you would have to take a look. Uh, we're, counting, we're, we're talking about 18,000 uh, retired veterans versus 377,000 veterans that live in Minnesota. The fiscal note uh, would uh, we'd have to probably have to pay all of our surplus uh, just for that. You know, that that kind of makes my point. We're yeah. we're we're selecting out a very narrow window of veterans here. And I respect everybody who was career, but there's a lot of us that aren't career that just feel a little offended by some of this sometimes, just so you know. Yeah. Hey, Madam Chair, and represent them. I would say most veterans organizations would, would support this, and I think uh, whether it's the VFW, American Legions, uh, they know those who have served, uh, you know, 20 years. Uh, they've been traveling, maybe moved every three years, served overseas, many deployments, and so forth. Uh, I think this is a, a good way to start off <coughs> at looking at those men and women who have, who have spent a career of 20 years or more uh, in the service. This is, 
Madam Chair. Representative Purcell. Uh, uh, this will be my last. This is something that I saw on a communication that was sent to me on this issue. That's why I'm a little hot. Those who have put their life on the line. It ain't just career, guys, and you know it. Representative Newton. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, um, you know, I don't want to get into the difference between the guard and the active duty, uh, yeah. but I, I think it has to be brought up where the average guard uh, member serves 39 days a year as opposed to active duty 365. And in a career, a 20-year career for a person in the Guard, they probably serve somewhere in the neighborhood of three years service, total service. Um, and uh, I, I just throw that out as a statement. So it, it sort of rankles um, to an extent some of us who have served uh, 20 years or more of, of active federal service. I do have a question for uh, Mr. Donne, if if he would look at this. Um, how many of the total retired are active duty uh, retired, those who have served 20 years or more? Mr. Dene. Uh, Madam Chair, Representative, uh, according to the latest actuary, there's 18,000 plus military retirees in, the, in <coughs> Minnesota. I can break it out for you by branch of service if you want. I have the list over there, I'll give it to you after the committee's done. The, the, the actuary breaks it down by how many are over age 65, uh, how many from what branch of the service. The actuary really goes into detail to give you all those facts if you want to get right down to the nitty gritty of it. But there's over 18,000 here in Minnesota that have done 20 years or more. But, oh, okay, I understand. There's only 16,000 that are being paid. There's several thousand that don't get to draw their retirement until they hit age 65. Those are the guard folks. 60. 60? 60. 60? Okay, it's back to 60 now. I retired in 94, so I'm not real good about what the guard's doing. But to say that they only do X amount of days a year, stop and think where our guard folks have gone the last few years. They did a heck of a lot more than one weekend a month, you know, throughout the year. They went to Afghanistan. They went to Iraq. <laughs> They've gone all over the world to support us. So I think that, this, you know, the idea that the Guard doesn't go anywhere, especially with the shrinking army that our, uh, our president wants to do, I think our Guard are going to be on the road a lot more than they are now. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative? Yeah. Representative Khan. Um, uh, 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 do we have the stated support from military organizations? Do we have any, is there any stated letters of support from, you said, you said something about support well, from military groups. Madam Chair, do we, have any? Uh, we do have military affairs here today, if uh, he would like to make some comments. I, I was talking about, I think Mr. Donay said something about all the military organizations supported this, and I wanted to know if there was any letters of support from them. Madam well, Chair, well, Representative Khan, if you, if you would like a letter, I can definitely write one up. We voted on this at our meeting, and it was, you know, the majority just said, wow, we want to do this. You said so, that the United Veterans yes, Council. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Representative Howe. Thank you, Madam Chair, but I, I believe Mr. Denae already made my point. Uh, my last deployment, I was replaced by an active duty contingent that the, one of the gentlemen that were that was replacing us had was a sergeant major first deployment I had folks that were working for me from the guard fifth deployment so I'm not going to get into who's rightfully owed what but I think uh, those of us of recent history have paid our dues representative Detmer renews his motion House file 2233 as amended be re referred to the Committee on Taxes. Yeah. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. The motion prevails. Yeah, thank you. Representative O'Driscoll. You always let Len Teske kill it, is that the deal? Two 
478. And there are amendments. And this was discussed in great detail at the passage of the omnibus finance bill from state government. And then this portion was sent on to the Public Safety Committee. And we know the issue, but Representative Driscoll is just going to remind us of it very <coughs> concisely. Representative Driscoll. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just two things. One, I, I uh, hope to be the shortest bill before the committee today. And number two, um, procedurally, how do you want to uh, do this? I'm fine with the DE1, and I'm also fine with the other A2 amendment that's on here. They're both clarifying uh, items on here. So I'm willing to uh, put the bill in its final shape. Uh, before we do, uh, background it and discuss it for the committee, if um, that's the wishes of the chair. <laughs> that, that's the wishes of the chair. You'll uh, make the original motion, then we can amend it. Madam Chair, I move the DE1 amendment on uh, House yeah. File 2478, please. First, you have to. I'm sorry, you, what is that? That's our new procedure. All right. I move uh, House File 2478 uh, before the committee to be, uh, to be discussed for the committee. Okay, Representative O'Driscoll. And Madam Chair, I, I move the DE1 amendment. Um, and I appreciate it very much, Representative O'Driscoll. Do you want to vote on the DE1 so we can um, put the A2 amendment on there as well, Madam Chair? Yes. Um, Representative Wills. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Representative O'Driscoll, I just have a question. You're taking out the effective date then by replacing the language? Did you intend to do that? Um, the DE1 amendment talks about it being available fiscal 2015, which would be July 1st of 2014, okay. because the so state runs in the middle of the year on the fiscal. So we do have the effective date by that, um, in the, uh, by referencing that fiscal date. Thank you. I appreciate the clarification. I just wanted to make sure the intention was still there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any further questions? All in favor of the adoption of the E1? Of the A2, over on A2? We're amending when did the that happen? <laughs> We're amending the amendment. Representative O'Driscoll, A2 amends. Correct. Madam Chair, I move the A2 amendment the to the E1. DE1 amendment. Yeah. All in favor signify by saying? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The motion is adopted. Representative O'Driscoll. Yeah. Madam oh. Chair, now I'd like to move the DE1 amendment as, as amended, as amended. As amended. Yeah. Right. and be uh, re-referred to the Committee on Public Safety. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Yeah. Opposed? The motion is adopted. And now we need to do the bill as amended. And now Chair. the bill has been amended. Thank you, Madam Chair. Very quickly, members. Um, as the chair pointed out last year during the, the um, working on the omnibus bill from this committee, there was great discussion on de-escalation training and funding. And the committee had extensive conversation and unfortunately at the time that we came back there was, uh, for whatever reason, non-inclusion of funds to be used for that de-escalation training for law enforcement for public safety. Originally when I drafted the bill this year, I went back to the original language that came to the committee and it's spoken to Chair Murphy that I would be willing to go back and uh, wanted to go back and get the exact language that was approved by this committee to be able to, to offer the, uh, uh, this as an amendment. The reason that I'm bringing this forward this year is earlier before session we learned that the Department of Veterans Affairs has turned back $110,000 on a program that they don't intend to use and uh, monies that they didn't intend to use on a paramedic apprentice program. And I started to think, well, gee, maybe what we could do is work some way, since we are the legislature, to use that money for veterans in funding something that this committee thought was, was an important priority. The, D, uh, the A2 amendment takes out the appropriation amount, and I'm fine with that because we don't know exactly what that number is going to be. My goal on behalf of the committee and the reason bringing this forward is to continue to keep this issue alive because we did say that this was an important issue, quite frankly, to keep people alive. 
because of some of the volatile situations that we may find and the skill levels of, of uh, the public servants who may uh, be called upon as first responders in situations. Madam Chair, that's all I have. If there's questions for the committee, I'm willing to take those. And I would, as Pretty I sure. said, uh, Representative O'Driscoll, I really appreciate that you went back to the original language and that you uh, accepted the A2 amendment also because um, it was our in it was my intent that um, with three training programs for early responders and uh, public safety training to our officers that are the first responders in this crisis situation that our public post-secondary institutions, there are three programs in Alexandria, in Hibbing, in uh, Fond du Lac Community College, where they are training people to do that sort of thing. And they should have the opportunity of developing a program. We hope, and I, that was the message this committee delivered last spring, um, <coughs> unanimously was that this will become a permanent part of the training of all officers and first responders. And it is a critical issue um, for public safety across the state. And we want a geographical balance and all that stuff. And there should be more than uh, one uh, agency that can deliver the message. And the opportunities should be there statewide. And uh, we hope that as a continuing appropriation, whether it's this committee or the Public Safety Committee, that they will heed our advice and uh, continue this and include this as part of the permanent training. So, that's it. Um, Representative Krisha? Thank you, Madam Chair, and just very quickly, and, and thank you, Representative O'Driscoll, for bringing this forward. Um, I fully support this, uh, and this touches our community in Little Falls. We had an incident that ended in a bad way because of this, and this is one of those times that you feel very good about something that's moving forward and something that can absolutely change lives, and I know in talking to the law enforcement and the family afterwards uh, how much something like this could have helped them. So. I commend you, I applaud you, and I, I thank you for that, for all the communities and, and the future folks that will be helped because of this. Yes. Madam Chair, are there any other questions? I'll um, just make one final comment. As I've said all along, we've been working on this. If you never read about it in the paper, you know it's doing its job. <laughs> Representative O'Driscoll renews his motion that House File 2378 as amended be uh, sent to the Public Safety Committee. Refer, re referred to the Public Safety Committee. As amended. As amended. amended. It's 2478. You said 2378. Oh, oh, 2478. Oh, that's because I read, was reading the wrong line. <laughs> 2478, as amended. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion is adopted. Thank you, Madam Chair, members. Representative Nelson. House file 2665. And uh, Madam Chair, I would like to move that House file 2665 be passed and re-referred to, where does it go? Anyway, I'll move be the bill to get it before the, the general register. Be placed on the general register. Okay. Really I, I didn't see that on the note I, you get, I have here. <laughs> and uh, Madam Chair and members, I have with me Mr. Kerr from Veterans of Military, Mil Military Affairs. Okay. <coughs> and what we have here, members, is the first of what will be many bills this session dealing with the unsession. Um, commitment that the governor has put forward to eliminate redundant and obsolete um, laws that are on the books to try and make the, as, as Representative Biskins used to say, make the law books smaller. Um, and that's what the, we're, we're going on here. 
Um, if you look at the bill, it's a real short bill. That's just a, a list of repealers. If you look on the back of the bill that you have in front of you, it lists what those repealers are. And if I go, um, I'll go down here one by one. The first one is the construction of laws from 1943. And again, this is this is uh, no longer necessary. It's outdated federal law. Um, the 192.12 commute, commuting, computating um, federal service. That's again unnecessary because it, it's we've used the federal law to do this, so we don't need to have it in our books. That one you want to keep the ball. That, that one actually can carry through. Okay. Okay. And uh, number three, the commissions may be vacated. Again, that's federal regulations as we go forward. Um, as you look at the bill number on the back of the bill, number four has to do with surplus officers. And I, when I read that the first time, it kind of chuckled that we're, dis we're uh, disposing of federal off or fe of people, but that's just the language of the bill. But that's, again, it's dealt with in the federal law. Discharge of enlisted members, again, with federal laws, it pertains to that. Arms and uniforms, again, it's federal law pertains to that. It's transportation, hire, and expense. Federal law processes allows for the state and the active personnel to already do this. So again, it's unnecessary. And again, the, the, the last piece is the desertion piece, and it's contained elsewhere in state and federal law. So it's redundant. And I think you mentioned there's one that we need to get. We're okay. With it. We're okay. 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 He mentioned he mentioned something to me earlier, and we're okay with it. So that's that's basically what the bill is. And I stand here. Mr. Kerr is here to answer any questions. So um, open it up to questions. Representative Lynch. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, Representative Nelson, uh, well, I would say, Mr. Kerr, I, you know, I know from the director, the, the governor, uh, who is looking to uh, repeal duplicative or, or outdated or obsolete language. I, I understand your charge, and you had to come up with, you had to come up with a laundry list and how that must have been difficult to do. But I, I actually have some, some strong reservations about several of these repealers, namely the first one, 19108. Um, is it your intention uh, in this to effectively um, repeal uh, chapter, I guess it would be 191, the unorganized militia? Mr. Kerr. Madam Chair, Representative Lesh. Uh, no, it is not, Representative Lesh, although uh, the ad at this time, it is not. Uh, we have had the discussion inside the agency, and uh, the unorganized militia has not been used uh, in the history of the state, at least not since that law was put on the books. And that is a discussion that we're looking at moving into the future, but we did not have the time to do the proper staff work to make that available for this session of the legislature. Well, and thank you, Madam Chair. Rep. Semlesh. And I and I appreciate that, Mr. Kerr. But um, as stated in 19006, uh, the militia of the state is organized into th those three three components, as you're aware: the National Guard, State Guard, and the unorganized militia. Now, um, everyone in the state is a member of the unorganized militia, up to 45, whether they know it or not, at least it's until you've you've uh, hit the federal minimum age for that. Um, and that's for a reason, because it's at the governor's disposal in case of uh, emergency or invasion or whatever. Uh, we also have provisions for the state militia. And what this uh, proposed repealer would do would be to obviate any provisions for the unorganized militia or the organized state militia, uh, and, and thereby, in an awkward scenario, uh, where the president decided to immediately federalize uh, the Minnesota National Guard under the National Guard Bureau, uh, there would be no recourse see what for the governor uh, or for this legislature um, of how to handle our own folks. So that is a concern of mine. And I can see why the agency uh, would be interested in doing that uh, because um, it's all National Guard. Uh, but I, I, re I believe that this power of the governor, uh, whether it's been used or not, is an important provision for our state, at least until the state of Minnesota is, is uh, directly dissolved into the, the federal government. Uh, we still have a state government. And Representative Lesh? Uh, yes, Madam Chair. In all the meetings, uh, Representative Nelson and I and others attended about the on session, they said that 
if there's any objection to any part, can be deleted. Do you have a motion? Uh, Madam Chair, I would move that on line 1.7, that 191.08 be deleted, and on line 1.8, 192.54, and section 192.66 would be deleted. <sighs> and I'm open for discussion on that, Madam Chair, because <clears throat> it may be there's some provisions of that they don't understand, but based upon my review, I, I don't have any problem with the, uh, the proposed repealers on the other items because I think they are duplicative. If I am incorrect on the motion I proposed, I'm, I'm open to be persuaded. Mr. Biggerstaff, do you have, do you understand the motion? Madam Chair, the, yes, I understand Representative Lesh's motion. I don't have anything to add on that. Right, but do you have, do you understand it and you could repeat it? Uh, Madam Chair, members, the motion was on line 1.7 to strike section 191.08 and on line 1.8 to strike 192.54 to 192.66. So the only thing remaining on line 1.8 would be are repealed. Rep Mr. Kerr, what do you think about that? Uh, Madam Chair, I have no objection to the amendment, though I, I would like to address uh, Representative Lesh's concern about 19108. Uh, I think he may be misreading. Uh, we believe 19108 refers to protecting members of the unorganized militia and the state guard from the ability of the federal government to draft them, which I don't think would prevent us from still exercising the authority of the governor in 1906 to call a state militia or form a state militia. But then their service in that state militia under 19108, um, 19108 means they could not be or they would not be protected from being drafted. And I don't know that the state could do that anyway. So I, I have no objection to the amendment though. That, that's uh, Your comment is absolutely correct. Any concern about what we're trying to do? Uh, we can leave them on the books. Well, and Madam Chair, you know, I, th I think uh, based on uh, Mr. Kerr's explanation, I think we are on the same page. Uh, the, the, currently, the only military forces of the state are comprised of the Minnesota National Guard, which no one argues is under federal law can be immediately federalized. Uh, but it does remove the ability of the governor uh, to, to organize a state militia or other provision under the organized militia, unorganized militia chapter 191, um, which would be... Uh, free from from being federalized, uh, and that's what I have some concern over, be it academic or otherwise. Representative so Nelson, what do you think? Madam Chair, I sat through the same meetings that you did, and, and as Mr. Kerr here has said, that that was the understanding that there were objections to parts of what we're trying to eliminate, that we would immediately drop those, and I, I will support Representative Lesh's amendment. Um, I, I prefer to, if there, I think I heard that there was an objection, and I would prefer to <coughs> accept the motion then because of what was said, and we don't want to throw something out and then have to put it back in in the future. Mm -hmm. And so uh, there are... Many pages and many hundreds of words that will be part of the uh, goal at the end. But um, I will support the motion that Rep. Sam Lesh has made, but I understand that we have to insert a word and. Mr. Biggerstaff. Madam Chair, the, the complete motion would be on line 1.7 to strike 191.08. And after 192.21, insert an, the word and after the colon, or the semicolon. And then on line 1.8, to strike 192.54, semicolon, and 192.66. Is that okay with you, Representative Nelson? 
Madam Chair, yes, it is. When, when, when uh, the motion was being read, I looked at it and going, they need to grammatically fix that, but I think the revisers can do that, but it's good that we do it beforehand. Right. And Mr. Kerr, you're in concurrence. Absolutely, Madam Chair. Right. Any further discussion? All paid, oh, Representative Just a quick, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, when repealing these uh, different sections here, is there any cost savings that uh, that are that were occurring after we repeal these this language? These, <coughs> Madam Rep Chair, Mr. Kerr, uh, Representative Detmer, the only cost savings I think we'll see would be a reduction in the size of the printed version of Minnesota statutes when sure. they're published. Okay, uh, which at some point could aggregate into something fairly substantial. <laughs> but certainly not by this contribution. Thank you. But I bet this committee won't see it. But who knows? <laughs> All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The motion is adopted. Madam Chair, uh, uh, thank you for that. I appreciate that. And Representative Nelson and for uh, Mr. Kerr's explanation and acceptance as well. Thank you, Representative Lesh. Representative Newton. Madam Chair, I'd like to move the minutes of uh, May 1st, 2013. Madam Chair, first, Madam Chair, do we have to we oh, the amendment? Yes. We first have to pass yes, the bill. I'm sorry. <laughs> that was the, we were voting on the Lesh motion to delete. Yes. Now, Madam Chair, I'd like now. to renew my motion that House File 2665 be re-referred to the General Register right. as amended. As amended. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? The motion is adopted. Thank you very much. Thank you. The bill will go to General Register as amended. Representative uh, Just before Representative Newton moves the minutes, I just have one correction to the February 26th minutes. Uh, just under members present, I'm not listed. I was there. I might have been quiet, but I was there. <laughs> and does this show the correction that I made, Mr. Wasilowski? Representative Newton. Madam Chair, uh, I uh, will move the minutes for May 1st, 2013, uh, the minutes of January 27th, 2014, and the minutes of February 26, 2014, as amended to add Mr. Freeberg. Any additions or corrections? I never do that. I never do that. Not all in favor of adopting the minutes as scheduled or as suggested, say aye. 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 Opposed? The minutes are adopted. Um, Ms. Casta, Krista, Casta, Mana Castillo uh, left some invitations for for us for an event, um, the page will pass them out. Be sure you get one before you leave. This meeting is adjourned. Well, just a minute, Mr. Marble, do you have an announcement? Six, sir. Oh, oh. Right. <laughs> this meeting is adjourned.